European Space Agency. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Isa. How do you hear me? And uh, Isa, DG, we have you loud and clear. Welcome to the International Space Station. Hello, Samantha, and really great to hear you. Uh, today, we are very honored to have uh, Mrs. Roberta Mezzola, the President of the European Parliament, with us on this call. Uh, the European Commission President, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen, just gave uh, a very important speech on the State of the Union, and uh, she really outlined that we are in a crisis and Europe has to act together uh, in order to really come out of this crisis strong. And uh, space, of course, is one vehicle, is one element to, to get out of this crisis stronger. Uh, in times of crisis, you need innovation, and that is what we are offering here in, uh, through space. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion of uh, Mrs. Metzola, and I'm sure she has many, many questions and many topics to discuss with you. So welcome here. Ciao, Samantha. Samantha. Hello, Madam President. It's, uh, it's such an honor to uh, welcome you here on board of the International uh, Space Station. And uh, through you and uh, the European Parliament as uh, elected representatives of uh, all of Europeans, I feel like uh, today I have an opportunity to welcome every European man, woman and child on the International Space Station. So thank you for this uh, privilege and this opportunity. Well, first of all, hello, Samantha. È un grande piacere di conoscerti eh, dallo spazio. Sei una fonte di ispirazione per molti di noi. Uh, congratulations very much, Samantha, on becoming the first female European commander of the International Space Station. And I love the flag that you are standing in front of. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to display the uh, European flag uh, here today. And uh, this particular flag will uh, fly back home with me uh, in in a few weeks when the mission is over. And so uh, I will be very honored if there will be an opportunity to uh, hand it over to you as uh, president of the European Parliament. Well, the honor would be all mine. Uh, I would very much like to meet with you in person when you come back. Uh, for, but perhaps a little bit of questions, a lot of people will see this conversation and I, I really want to know what, what does it feel like uh, to be uh, in your position today? Uh, what are your duties? If I can think of so many young people, they dream on, on becoming, you know, footballers, famous actors, musicians, but becoming an ISS commander must be mind-blowing. So how did this happen? When did you think this would be possible? And how did you manage something so amazing? Well, I think what, what what's truly amazing is to be up here in space and, and be able to serve uh, first and foremost as a crew member of uh, the International Space Station. And I, uh, it was my dream since I was a small child to one day be able to fly to space. I, I was inspired by, by many things, I think, from, uh, you know, marveling at the beauty and mystery of the night sky to amazing teachers from elementary school on who really transmitted to me a, a passion for, for discovery for exploration, for, uh, for adventure, uh, books I read, TV shows, and then growing up in school, a passion for science, technology. So I eventually became an engineer by education, and then I decided to serve in, uh, in the Italian military. I was trained as a combat pilot for a few years. And then about 13 years ago, I had this amazing opportunity of, uh, of joining ESA as part of the European Astronaut Corps. And uh, I had one first mission a few years ago, and on this second mission, uh, I will have the privilege for uh, a short time to serve as uh, commander of the space station, which, which really just means uh, doing my best to enable the um, amazing team that we have here on orbit to perform at their best. Uh, you know, taking care of the well-being of the team uh, ensures smooth communication with uh, the ground. And in case of, of nominal situations or emergencies, making sure that I coordinate a, a, you know, an efficient and effective response uh, on uh, on behalf of our of our team here uh, on orbit, but most importantly, really looking uh, working uh, well together with the extended team that we have all around the world, uh, including our Columbus Control Center in uh, in Europe in Munich. 
Well, I can tell you that if I was a young girl looking at you today, uh, I think you would inspire me to at least dream uh, of, uh, of uh, um, embarking on, on this amazing path that you uh, embarked on from a young girl, uh, if I can say, and until today that you are uh, at such an amazing uh, place with such an amazing example to give uh, to young girls around the world. If we can maybe a little bit more detail, like what is the most promising or exciting project that you are currently developing at the at the International Space Station. Uh, I know that there is a variety of research projects, uh, including on medicine, materials, physics or biology um, undertaken on the ISS. Perhaps you could describe the ones that were most exciting uh, or memorable to you? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right, uh, Madam President. We have a, an amazing laboratory up here uh, in space where we take advantage of this very unique condition of microgravity, which is really weightlessness, you know, right? Just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm floating here, everything floats. We can uh, switch off the effects of, of gravity as long as we're up here in space. And so there's a number of uh, phenomena that uh, uh, happen in, in life sciences, in biological systems. You know, we study our own body, we study animals models, we study plants, cell tissues, tissue cultures, cell cultures, um, and also in the physical phenomena. And actually, um, I would be, um, uh, you know, I, it's always hard to say this is my favorite experiment or this is the most exciting one. I don't want to do that. But maybe uh, just the ones I've worked on recently were mostly in the physical domains. Uh, one of the things we study up here is the stability and behavior of foams and emulsions that is very different in microgravity and allows us to really get a, an understanding of the physics involved there, and that is uh, uh, incredibly useful in, in the um, medicine industry, food industry, uh, and in general, the, the chemical uh, um, industry. Materials, I think you mentioned, are also very important. It's, a, you know, you, you, you have an opportunity by switching off gravity to get a deep understanding of the physical phenomena involved, for example, in metal um, melts. Uh, but also, I'm very fascinated by the technological development. Uh, ISS is a stepping stone to go further and, and continue to explore the solar system. And so it's also important to continue to develop technologies and mature technologies that um, enable that. Um, for example, just recently I had an opportunity to work with the ESA ANITA-2, which is a, a very compact technology to automatically analyze the composition of the air to make sure that we do not have, for example, any toxic substances in the air. Well, I think that that's, that sounds amazing. And, you know, I'm standing here, or actually I'm sitting here, and no, no lack of gravity here. I'm sitting very much firmly in my chair uh, in uh, the European Parliament. Uh, behind me is uh, the plenary, so which is where all the members of the European Parliament gather together. Uh, but we don't talk enough about space. We don't talk about enough about behavioural aspects. I would like to see more members of the European Parliament that have a STEM educational background, more women in science and uh, technology. Uh, I, I see that there's a big lack or a big gap between what we as politicians do and the decisions that we need to take and the impact of such decisions on the research, on the discoveries that you make, but also on the awareness of what how, how our behaviour here on Earth uh, should change, uh, should be more educated, should be understood as having such an impact even on, your, uh, on what you see. So perhaps a question is like, what role can your activities, I mean here I would like advice that you would give me and my colleagues, for example, increasing our understanding of space around the Earth, uh, help us understand and tackle our most pressing challenges, uh, like, uh, like climate change. Uh, you know, it's a word we use all the time, uh, but we like to use it in a, in, a big, uh, in a big format and not in how we can change our life, how our laws can, 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 if not reverse, slow down the catastrophic climate change we have seen and are seeing on Earth. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I think that we uh, we are transitioning, uh, or probably that transition has happened already, to a perception of space as something separate, like a separate domain, uh, to something that just permeates 
our societies, our economies, our industries, our ways of living together, and our ability to tackle big global challenges from, you know, geopolitical crisis to uh, climate change to uh, food security. Um, Everything nowadays, every solution is enabled in general, I would say, probably by technology and scientific understanding, but specifically by space infrastructures. Uh, and so um, making sure that we continue to develop that infrastructure, that we continue to um, uh, develop and improve the ability to exploit that infrastructure to deliver information, data and services for the benefits of, uh, of all our citizens. Um, and, and making sure, of course, that we can maintain that infrastructure safe. All of that, I think, has become uh, strategically important. And so uh, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's very important for our uh, leaders, uh, elected officials, decision makers to have a deep understanding of the potential of space. And, you know, now when I tell my children tonight that I have uh, spoken to you, uh, I'm sure they're going to ask me this question uh, and I'm sure they're going to want me to have asked you this, so I'm going to do it. Um, and if you can explain a little bit what your day looks like, uh, you know, what are your, your day-to-day -day challenges. I could see while we were preparing uh, this, uh, this uh, conversation, I could see you trying to hold, make sure the bottle of water is held uh, and not flying around behind you. Um, what are the biggest challenges you have and then if you have free time um, uh, how do you spend it and, and how many people do you interact with and do you do you call home often how, how, how is it I guess technology has allowed this to become easier than uh, for members of the I, for, for, of the ISS in previous years but but I think still there are challenges I, I, I if you can just lay it down to how I would explain it to my uh, to my children <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So uh, we have pretty busy work days. We start around 7.30 in the morning. Like in many offices, we start with a meeting, uh, except that our meeting uh, occurs uh, on space to ground radio. And uh, it occurs uh, um, via satellite communication so that we are able to talk for a few minutes with all the control centers around the world who are responsible for um, the operations on the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, and then we all go off to our tasks for the day. Like, for example, today I have spent uh, actually all of my morning working on a experiment. Most likely I will not be just working on my own on that experiment. I will be talking to uh, people on the ground who are either the developer of the experiments or in any way are experts on that experiment so that they can um, guide me through it. If there's any issue, we can troubleshoot uh, together. So although we we look like we're very isolated up here in space, we are actually in very, very close connection with this uh, enormous extended team uh, of uh, researchers and scientists and engineers and flight controllers all over the world. World. And so the day then goes by pretty quickly. Um, around 7.30 in the evening, we have another uh, uh, one of those conferences, of those meetings uh, on space to ground to wrap up the day. We do have um, throughout the day also two and a half hours of mandatory uh, workouts, like uh, physical activity. Uh, we have a machine that allows us to do weightlifting and weightlessness, which uh, I know sounds like an easy win, but uh, it's actually a pretty uh, intense workout because the machine does create the resistance we need to make sure we train our muscles and also keep our bones uh, strong. Otherwise, in space, because of the weightlessness, we would... Uh, uh, um, experience um, some kind of very accelerated osteoporosis, which obviously we do not want. Um, and in terms of the free time, yes, absolutely. I call my, my family on, on most days, and uh, as you hinted, uh, technology really allows us to, to, feel, uh, to feel connected and maintain that, that presence also in our, in our family lives. Well, thanks for that. It sounds like a very busy day uh, that you have every day and that you can really need teamwork also to be able to, to, to spread it out towards uh, one day. I think I, we're, we're running sort of shortly out of time, but perhaps one question that has, that has been um, put uh, to me uh, to ask you, uh, it's about uh, debris in this space. So while there are about 2,000 active satellites orbiting the Earth at the moment, there are also around 3,000 dead ones, um, a littering space, and there are also around 34,000 pieces of space uh, junk bigger than 10 centimeters in size and millions of smaller pieces that could nonetheless 
let's say, prove disastrous if they hit something? Uh, are you working in any way on the issue of space debris? And, and have you experienced yourself dangers that space debris pose to the ISS and all other functioning satellites? Uh, yes, well, f first of all, I would like to say this is a topic on which uh, ESA uh, works uh, hard and intensively with the um, uh, Space Safety Program and the Space Debris Office. Uh, here on ISS, uh, yes, we come in contact quite frequently with, uh, with the issue. In fact, uh, just uh, yesterday, the flight controllers on the ground were tracking what we call a conjunction, which means a piece of space debris that is big enough to be monitored from the ground. You know, that there's assets of situational awareness where those uh, pieces of debris get um, tracked. And uh, if there is a even a remote chance that that piece of debris might come in contact with the space station, then the flight controllers plan an avoidance maneuver. So we turn and basically we move out of uh, the way. Um, but the the quantity, the increasing quantity of space debris in low Earth orbit, of course, makes those uh, potential conjunctions a lot more frequent than they used to be. And it also becomes more complicated to plan those debris avoidance maneuvers because you might move out of the way, but you also have to make sure that when you move, you don't get into another potential conjunction. So your, your degrees of freedom there become more uh, constrained. So just to finish the story that debris avoidance so the conjunction cleared to that piece of debris in the end did not uh, pose, pose a threat, but it's certainly something that comes up fairly often. Um, but yeah, on, but in terms of uh, what we do at the European Space Agency, I would actually uh, love to hear what the Director General Aschbacher uh, would like to uh, offer on this topic. No, thanks. Uh... Samantha, in fact, uh, we are doing a lot, as, uh, as you say. Um, the European Parliament in Strasbourg is actually not too far away from uh, our center. We just opened a new space safety center in Darmstadt, uh, which is in, in Germany, uh, but uh, really dealing with uh, space safety, space traffic management, space debris issues, uh, which we are experiencing. So what we do is, of course, monitoring the state, but also telling our satellites, commanding our satellites then to fly uh, avoidance uh, maneuvers. Uh, in fact, we're doing this now much more often than we used to do in the past. Uh, today, we do it about once a week, every 10 days. We used to do it every couple of months. So this also shows how much debris uh, there is. Uh, just the most recent uh, uh, ASA test, uh, which happened at the end of last year, uh, caused a huge amount of uh, debris where Matthias Maurer, our astronaut, had to take shelter in the in the capsule, uh, and the space station had to fly these orbit uh, man maneuvers to, to avoid it. So, yes, this is a huge issue. Uh, and also, uh, there we need regulation. We need international regulation, but also we need technology where we can address the issues. For example, we develop a new uh, satellite that literally grabs uh, an upper stage of, uh, of a rocket and takes it out of, uh, of the orbit in order to just get rid of one piece. It's a bit like uh, uh, vacuum cleaner or, or garbage uh, collection, if you wish, in, in space. And this is something that uh, that we're really developing, but of course, in a large scale. And this really reminds us that um, out there in space, we are, of course, depending on each other. Uh, it's not only Europe that uh, has to take care of its asset. It's really a global effort. And there we have international mechanisms uh, that do that, United Nations and, and other bodies. So yes, uh, this is a big task. And uh, we are quite active, actually, at the European level. We have a so-called zero debris policy, which uh, I am uh, installing now with my member states, where we would like to have, just like on, on ground, where we have uh, carbon neutrality, uh, we would like to have uh, space debris neutrality by 2030 up in space. That means one object in means an object out. And uh, this is, of yeah. course, a big task. And uh, we well, are leaders in you. Europe here. And thank think, you I so much. We, we can yeah, really, grazie. Uh, uh, grazie, uh, Samantha. Ci rivediamo. Presto. <laughs> Spero. And thank you, Mr. Ashbacher. Okay, thank Grazie. you very much. Thank you so much. Such an Grazie. honor. Grazie. Such an honor, Madam President. Okay. The honor is mine. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from ESA. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.